Welcome to the Wonderfest studio. I'm here today with research physicist Ryan Rigg of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in the San Francisco Bay Area. Ryan is a veteran of nuclear fusion research, and he's here today to talk to us about that subject. Ryan earned his bachelor's degree in physics at Stanford University and his PhD in physics at MIT. The man knows his stuff. Ryan, welcome to the gamma sector of, uh, of the Milky Way. Thanks, Tucker. I've never been here before. <laughs> I think you'll like it. Ryan, let's start with a straightforward question about the nature of, of fusion. What is nuclear fusion? Nuclear fusion occurs when two light nuclei, such as hydrogen, uh, are driven together and collide with high enough energy that they can overcome their electric repulsion and they bind into a heavier element such as helium and in the process they release a significant amount of energy. The lighter nuclei such as hydrogen will give off more energy. If you try to fuse heavy, heavier elements uh, above that of about iron, then it's actually an endothermic process. It takes energy in order to fuse those heavier nuclei. We know that energy is conserved, but in a nuclear reaction, in any reaction, energy undergoes a transformation. In what form was the energy to begin with? And what is the final state of that energy? Well, as the reactants are, the reactant nuclei are forced together, they can eventually get close enough that they overcome their electric repulsion and the strong nuclear force is sufficient to overcome that repulsion and it binds them very tightly together. This loss of the nuclear potential energy uh, is then converted into the kinetic energy of the product particles. So, so the net result is the nuclear potential energy of the reactants gets converted into kinetic energy of the products. Another way that this um, is measured is in the difference of the mass of the reactants and the products. Um, and this difference in mass, um, as you may have seen in earlier videos um, from Einstein's equation E equals mc squared, there's a big difference in the energies uh, when there's a small difference in the mass. In, in my research, uh, we are focused primarily on deuterium-tritium fusion. Uh, deuterium and tritium are isotopes of hydrogen uh, which have the highest probability of fusion. During the fusion reaction, the reactant deuterium-tritium get converted into a helium and uh, a neutron, and the change in the nuclear binding energy of the reactants and products gets converted into the kinetic energy of the products. In order to turn the kinetic energy of the fusion products into electricity, the kinetic energy gets thermalized uh, in some liquid medium such as water, which will then absorb the heat and oil and run a steam turbine. Uh, ultimately, even a high-tech energy source such as fusion will, in the end, just be used to boil water to run a steam turbine to keep your lights on. Excellent, Ryan. Thank you. And what about this almost legendary promise of nuclear energy. What makes nuclear fusion, in particular, so promising, and, and, and why is it that way? One of the most exciting prospects of fusion is the extreme abundance of potential fuel. Deuterium, a heavy isotope of hydrogen, has a, an abundance of about one of every 6,000 hydrogens. So for example, if you take all the deuterium in one gallon of ocean water and you're to fuse it into helium, you'd have the energy equivalent of 300 gallons of gasoline. So having 300 oceans of gasoline worth of fusion fuel energy just in the oceans is essentially an unlimited supply of fuel. Another appealing aspect of fusion as an energy source is there are no carbon dioxide emission Carbon dioxide uh, is a greenhouse gas that's of great concern for the global warming problem. In addition to no carbon dioxide emissions, there's no long-lived radioactive ash, uh, as is the case with traditional nuclear fission 
energy. The product of the fusion process uh, is helium and neutrons. These neutrons can activate the containment vessel for the fusion process, and the activation will result in some radioactivity of the vessel, but the activity level and the half-life uh, is much lower and much shorter than radioactive ashes of fission products. How about uh, the, the challenges of nuclear fusion? It does seem to be so promising, but there must be some difficulties that you're facing as a researcher. So the fundamental challenge of fusion is to overcome this electric repulsion of the nuclei. And in order to do so, we need to raise the temperature of deuterium tritium fuel to 100 million degrees. And then we need to confine this fuel long enough for fusion to occur. Right now, there are two principal avenues that we're attempting in order to achieve this confinement. One is known as magnetic confinement fusion, where strong magnetic fields are used to contain the hydrogen fuel. And the other, which I've been working on, is called inertial confinement fusion, where we compress the fuel in order to get it to react fast enough that it fuses before the fuel's own inertia allows it to expand and cool down. At Lawrence Livermore Lab, uh, they've built the largest laser in the world to pursue inertial confinement fusion, um, where these lasers are used to deposit energy to compress these uh, inertial confinement fusion pellets. An example of one of the challenges that we face in inertial confinement fusion is to compress a spherical pellet of this deuterium tritium to very high densities and pressures. So if you imagine trying to take um, a water balloon and, and um, you try to compress it as symmetrically as possible, if you're not perfect, it's going to squirt out wherever you're not pressing into it. Um, but instead of trying to compress it just a little bit, we're trying to compress it thousands of times. So wherever there isn't sufficient pressure to compress it spherically, then the fuel will squirt out that way and we won't obtain the high pressures uh, and compressions that we require. In order to address the difficulty of achieving such high spherical symmetry, we require the engineering of extremely round capsules. And we use, at the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore Lab, we divided this laser energy into 192 individual beams in order to drive the capsule as symmetrically as possible. In the long term, we hope that all of these challenges will be addressed and overcome. But if you ask different experts in the field, the most optimistic view will say we might solve these problems in 30 years, and the most pessimistic might say never. So when we'll get an economically viable fusion electricity will depend on the level of funding.